You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Two author interviews and five book reviews each week. Well, how are you and how are you doing? I thought I was okay, but I had quite a perplexing time this morning. So I've got a T-shirt on, a bright green T-shirt on today with the words, nope, not today. And I was walking the dog and someone came up to me and said, oh, it's so nice to see something so positive. Thank you for such a lovely message on your T-shirt. And I thought, are they taking them in? No, they were being serious. Anyway, it transpired that they thought my T-shirt said hope. And they hadn't seen the not today bit underneath. And I had to break it to them that it didn't say hope. It said no. So I'm afraid I, uh, yes, crushed their their dreams. But anyway, we've got a lot to talk to you about. What have we got coming up? We've got an interview with the wonderful Mike Gale, whose latest book is The Museum of Ordinary People. Then Helen Monks Tucker is answering five questions in five minutes about her book, Such a Good Mother. I'm also reviewing The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller, The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward, and How to Kidnap the Rich by Rahul Rana. Now, of these five books, one I didn't take to. One, there was a journey, shall we say, and the other three absolutely consumed, loved, inhaled, all of the above in bold italics. Great. So, Let's get on with the first interview. And this, as I say, is with Mike Gale. Let me tell you about this book, The Museum of Ordinary People. Still reeling from the sudden death of her mother, Jess is about to do the hardest thing she's ever done, empty her childhood home so that it can be sold. But when in the process, Jess stumbles across the mysterious Alex, together they become custodians of a strange archive of letters, photographs, curios and collections known as the Museum of Ordinary People. As they begin to delve into the history of the objects in their care, Alex and Jess not only unravel heartbreaking stories that span generations and continents, but also unearth long buried secrets that lie much closer to home. And let's do the first sentence. This is the prologue. Do I do the prologue? Oh, I know you have me every time saying, do I do the prologue or not? I'm doing the prologue. On the morning of my final day at Mum's, I awoke suddenly to the sound of footsteps coming along the hallway. For a split second, I imagined that it was Mum and the past few weeks had been just a terrible dream. But then I heard the sound of boyish laughter and remembered how thin the walls in these terraces were and realised that it was the young kids of the family next door. Um, Before we talk to Mike, let me say, I enjoyed this book so much. It really moved me. I thought it was, yeah, thought provoking. I use that phrase too much, but um, it was gentle in some ways and yet really sort of gripping and gutsy in others. And you're, oh, you're getting cross with characters and you're loving characters. So it's just a book that consumes you. Um, I thought I thought it's excellent. And let's talk to Mike Gale now. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Mike Gale, whose latest wonderful book is The Museum of Ordinary People. Welcome to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. I really uh, can't wait to get started. Thank you. Obviously, it's a story about stories. I just love the way it unraveled all these different people's stories. What gave you the idea for this book? Uh, I've got a friend of mine. He runs a... uh, uh, well, he's got a vintage shop, essentially. And uh, we were talking one day. And so he's always, you know, looking at things that people have been thrown out. And he was walking past the house and it was quite clearly being cleared. And it was quite clearly a deceased property because in the skip was um, this person's, uh, was, was somebody's, uh, like a bag with all the personal items. So there were photos and letters and postcards and things. And... Um, my friend, he had a real dilemma because he kind of felt like he just, he felt like it was wrong for them to be in a skip, but equally he didn't really know, have any kind of sort of connection to this person. Um, but in the end, it's sort of just in recognition of the sort of humanity of it all, I suppose. He took the things and he took them home just to keep them safe. And I was telling this story to other people over the years and, uh, Lots of people have got their own stories. So there was another friend who uh, they'd moved into a new house and uh, well, they just bought a house and 
when they went into the loft, they discovered uh, a, a suitcase full of somebody's personal items. And it, it turned out it didn't belong to the person that they bought it from or even the person before that. And so it, it was, you know, and they didn't know what to do with this thing. And it just struck me that, um, you know, there needs to be a place where you can take things where you haven't got the space for them and where they can just sort of be given a little bit of honour, a little bit of dignity in recognition of, of the lives that they sort of represent. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the idea of the Museum of Ordinary People came from. And, um, you know, the more I've talked about it and more people have read it, they, they all, everybody sort of knows what they would put in the museum and everybody sort of also feels like it would be a wonderful thing to exist just, you know, because, you know, lots of people have, have had to get when they've cleared grandparents' houses or, or parents' houses. There have been things that have meant a lot to them, but just because of room or size or just because you've already kept so much stuff already, it, it feels like it feels like a crime to get rid of them. But you, you, you know, you, you want to kind of hold on to them, I suppose, especially things that people have made, I think, that's a special mm. thing, you know. It, it feels like it feels really bad to sort of get rid of something that some somebody has created. And I do think it's a reflection on the times as well, because it always used to be that everything people didn't have much, but what they had were passed yes. down and carried on through the generations. And yet now people, you know, don't have enough space, and families are, aren't um, as sort of united yeah. as maybe they were, or people are on their own. And so you do have these really important things that might not be uh, worth a lot of money, but mean so much. And it does, it just makes you think about your life and what's important. For, yeah, for exactly. Well. In, in the process of writing, it, it, it did make me kind of think, well, you know, um, what other things are important? What other things I can get rid of now to sort of save somebody having to kind of trawl through my stuff? Because it, it, mm. it's, and, and it's always, and it's not about value. And I, I suppose one of the things I wanted to think about was this idea that when we go to museums, it's always about the, the things that belonging to the great and the good, or, or even sometimes the things that are really, really old. But what about the things that are sort of, you know, not so old, but sort of still mean a lot or meant a lot to somebody? And, and sort of speaks to people's lives, especially letters. You know, letters, uh, they sort of capture a moment. And, and quite often the, the fact that these things have existed for, you know, 10, 20, 30 odd years, it feels, it feels wrong to sort of say, OK, we're going to bin this story and just never return to it. I don't know. Yeah, my mother's always saying, "Oh, I've got to get rid of, got to get rid of everything, so you don't have to sort through when I'm not here." And I said, "Yeah, but if they give you joy, keep them, and then it's for yeah. me to, yeah. to to work through that. Don't get rid of the things that that give you joy." And letters now, are so rare. If someone sends you a letter, it'd be amazing just to treasure that. Exactly, exactly. Sign yeah. of the times. Um, but we meet Jess, and she's the cornerstone of the book of, for me. How early did you know who she was and her story? From the very beginning, I knew that this was a book because I, I wanted to tell two stories, really, and then the book is essentially two stories. It's the story of Jess. Um, she uh, loses her mum unexpectedly and uh, at quite a young age, a relatively young age, and so she ends up having to clear her mum's house when she leaves thought she would have to do it um, and so there's a, there's a there's a timeline within the story where she spends a week clearing her mum's house and going through everything that emotionally that's going on and she does it alone but then the, the kind of main body of the story is takes place a year later with her having she's kept hold of some small things and, and things that she knows she wants to keep but there are there's a larger item um, that she wants to keep, which is a set of encyclopedias which sort of represent her mum's hopes and dreams for her. And so I, I kind of knew that she was the heart of the book. I knew that she was, was you know, it, it's her, it was going to be the story of her working through her grief, but also finding a way in, in the kind of short term, in the immediate loss of her mum, but also working through her grief a year later, but finding it, a really positive outlet through it in in the form of the Museum of Ordinary People. And your books are so thought provoking. Is it 
does it help you work through your own things when you're writing or actually does it sort of add to your emotional burden <laughs> if that's the right way of saying it? I think I think it, it, it does I think I, I like you know you, you've used the phrase um, that they make you think and I I think I, I love that I love making me think while I'm writing and um, and I think there's there's an element of anticipation I suppose when when you know your your parents are getting older and you know you've seen friends go through similar sorts of things there is an element of thinking well what might that be like and what and how might I respond in that or how might one of my characters respond to that so it's yes there's, there's, there's definitely an element of of I suppose being prepared to look into something that you know is going to kind of come your way at some point and and trying to do it without being clouded by the memory of your own experience I mean I think there is a place for your own experience but I think in terms of communicating things to readers, it, I think as a writer you you get to this, you get to kind of think through the character, and so you feel through the character. And so, I was able to kind of put myself in a situation, but it wasn't me; it was, it was Jess, and working through how it might feel, what you might see and do and be thinking about. And are you able to turn those characters off in your head when you've finished the book, or do they linger in your mind? Um, I, I do. Um, I think I always feel like I'm, I'm a caretaker for them for <laughs> a certain period of time. <laughs> and so when we first meet each other, it, it's, you know, it's a little bit awkward. We don't really know each other. We're, there's a process of sort of getting to know each other and then by the time you get to the middle you feel like you know you've been friends since forever and then I think as you as you when you get to the end I feel like you're you're waving goodbye but you're waving goodbye having brought them to a better place and so I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm hanging on to them because I feel like my job was to kind of get them through the difficult part of their their life and for them to move on to something bigger and better i love that a temporary caretaker for them. that's it yes <laughs> yeah that's that's a great thing i do hear from some authors saying that they get besieged by family members and friends saying oh i've got a great idea for your for a book for you you know i've heard this and i've heard that and i just wonder do you get a lot of those because of what you write about I think it tends to come more from readers, I think, because I write about um, ordinary people. I think that a lot of my readers sort of feel that it it kind of means that maybe perhaps their life and the things that have happened in their lives might be worthy of being turned into a novel. And, it, and you know, that's one of the reasons, why, you know, I, I, I set out across all of my books. They, they all tend to be about ordinary people. Um, they're not necessarily particularly um, uh, outlandish situations, but but still situations that can cause turmoil and can cause upset, and that we all, in in our own different ways, have to sort of work through. And so, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I I get a lot of that, and I always say I always say to them, look, you know, I think the best person to write your story is you. If you really, mm. if you really feel that this is what you want to do, then you sh you should do it. And um, but for me, I don't need to be tied down to reality too much. Uh, you know, um, I think a lot of people used to feel certainly in the early days used to feel like I was just sat there transcribing my life and the things that were happening to me. <laughs> and um, the truth is, I am actually very boring, and I quite <laughs> like being boring. So um, you know, I live out all of my angst and all of my through my stories and uh, and then I return to my very boring, very safe world. <laughs> and we don't just have the story of Jess, we have all these other characters and, and their stories. I was interested in whether they were fighting as you were writing to have more um, pages devoted to, to them and their stories. Um, yes, yes. I mean, in particular, Alex. Um, so Alex mm. is, I suppose he's the the other main protagonist and he the, the story could have so easily been from his perspective because somebody names him in his will so the, so basically the 
the museum is set in the, the actual physical place of the museum is in um, uh, the back of a clearance company in Peckham and the previous owner Mr Barclay um, has passed away and in his will he named Alex as um, as his beneficiary and so when Jess comes to see the museum for the first time uh, she encounters Alex who is also on his own journey because he's in this very strange situation where he's inherited this place um, from a man that to as far as he knows he has no connection to and so you, you could so easily have, have told the story from his perspective and I, I did really struggle because I wondered whether it was a two-hander I wondered whether it was uh, you know whether it should be his story and in the end the thing that decided it I think was the my need or my desire to kind of want to look at Jess tell, tell the story of Jess clearing her mum's mm. home and that meant that she was going to be given the majority of the space. Uh, and uh, were you writing the two parts as you wrote the book, or did you write Jess's story and then wrote her with the other theme that you were writing about? I always, uh, I always write um, consecutively, uh, so I, I always write uh, in sequence. And it's, and I, I, there's a there's a reason for that. I, I think, um, and. It, maybe it's other, but you know, you know, I don't know about other people. All I know is about me, and I know that if I wrote out of sequence, it would be clear in my writing that there might be things that I enjoyed writing more than other things. <laughs> and so, you know, you, 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 I, 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 that's my fear, I suppose. And so, I feel like, no, you have to be. I have to be really disciplined. I have to kind of dedicate. Make sure I give a hundred percent to everything, so that there is no telling which was my favourite part to write. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Let's just talk about the emotions as well. You know, this grief, loss, self belief, self awareness. How do you get the balance right? So, yes, we're very moved, but equally, we're not crying and needing counselling with every single page that. We <laughs> It's a, it's a really difficult balance um, because I, I, I like to um, talk about real things and, and, and quite emotional things. But equally, I like making people laugh and um, and having quirky things in there as well. And I, I think for me, it's, it's about it's about contrast. I think the reader, you know, so often when um, when people describe my books, they talk about it being a roller coaster ride. And I think, I think that's a perfect description because that's what I really want. I want the bits, I want you to feel like you never know what emotion you're going to encounter um, in the next page. You know, I, I like the idea of you laughing one moment and then being almost reduced to tears in the next moment because that's where the roller coaster comes in. And the reason why we like roller coasters is that they're, they're not just level. Um, they're not like mm. a train ride. There, there are there are ups, there are downs, there are moments where you think, oh, this is this is absolutely fine, and then suddenly it careers off to, um, you know, oblivion and, and darkness. And so um, that's I, I do like that that kind of mixing things up. But it is it is very it, it is quite difficult to balance um, because, like you say, you don't want to depress people. You want people to <laughs> feel, but you also want people to. You know, enjoy its fiction and to, to enjoy it um, at the same time. So it, it's a, uh, it's a, it's very much a tightrope. And if there's too much sort of grief or sadness, that in a way it kind of dilutes the emotion. Exactly, it would that's for it. Me. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so, so for instance, the the I was talking with someone recently, and the the parts where Jess is uh, at home with her mum um, can be quite sad. But they're they're only sort of shortish, and mm. they're part of a much bigger story. So that because we know that this this the main body of the story is about her trying to do something positive with her grief and trying to move forward in in her life. Right. There's some quick fire questions now. I'll try the first my best. One. Thank you. Museums or libraries? Oh. Uh, I'd have to say libraries. Um, uh, <laughs> I, 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 
I don't think without my local library, I don't, I don't think I, I would have become a, a, a writer. You know, my love of writing came from my weekly trip to the library to kind of get just William books and things like that. So, uh, yeah, libraries. <laughs> Lots of edits or no edits? Lots of edits. Um, I don't think there's anybody who gets it right first time. Um, and I, I, and even those who think that they get it right first time, there's, there's not many sentences that can't be improved, or many books indeed that can't be improved with editing and finesse. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, book cover or book title? Oh, do you know, for me, it, it'd have to be book title. Um, mm. um, again, it's, it's a difficult one because lots of book titles are quite generic. Um, but I think I deliberately choose book titles that spark off a picture in your mind. And I think you can do all sorts of things with book jackets, but I think, and that and that's sort of literally kind of showing you, it's this. Whereas mm. I think with a title, uh, a really good title, it, it paints such, it can paint an even more vivid picture, and one that's probably worth more than the cover, I think. I guess in some ways the title can be the blurb or the, the strap line. Exactly, yes. Itself. Yes, yeah, very much so. Um, the last quick-fire question. These aren't the very quick-fire, like, certainly my answers aren't. Really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, they're brilliant. They're, br- they're absolutely brilliant. Uh, when you finish writing a book, is there a final full stop or do you type the end? Uh, There's a final full stop, and occasionally I'll type the end. But mainly, um, again, it's a difficult one, um, because when I write a first draft, I'm unlikely to type the end, because I know that there's going to be a second draft. Um, (laughs) And so when when I suppose when I send it to my agent and editor, I I might type the end to kind of just to signal that. um, But I think, really... Thinking about it, if you've told your story correctly, um, it will be completely obvious that it's the end. Um, yeah. yeah, you know. Um, although it's, it's, it can be quite hard to tell with with um, some books, certainly a lot of thrillers. There's there's always a, like yes. a, a last page uh, yes. twist of some description. Yeah. One so year later, who knows and, when yeah, the end is? All of that. Yeah, which yes, is yeah. Several years yeah. later, after that, that's to, interesting because yeah. some authors type the end after their first draft because it's almost like they've they finished the birth of the book and they're ex- they're exhausted from that and they just want to celebrate it. Whereas yeah. that's interesting that you still want to work on it and and you don't type that until it's ready to send off for its first look. Yeah, I, I, I know that there's more work to come, so it, it, it's it's nice to get to the end, and I, I feel it, but there's typing it would just... It, I would know that that was sort of dishonest because, you know, there's more work to come, Michael. <laughs> you have such a strong reputation as an author and so well-known. Is that a, a burden sometimes? It's difficult, and I, I completely get it. I think readers come to books with expectations, and you kind of want to meet those expectations, but at the same time, you kind of want to thwart them because if you're always meeting their expectations, then they're going to get bored pretty fast. Um, and I, so I, it can be quite difficult. There's nothing like quite like being a debut author because you have this opportunity. Nobody know you're an unknown quantity. And so you you can't, nobody can use your reputation against you, almost. And so they enjoy the book for what it is. And I think sometimes it would be nice if readers could come to books without expectations. Mm. I think that would be, and it's impossible because, you know, I, I do it myself. But in, in a, a lot of ways, coming to books with expectations just means especially a particular author so if you think oh this author made me feel this way this time mm. I really want to feel that way again you're only ever going to be compared <laughs> yes you know you're yeah. always trying to outdo yourself almost and it's it's a slightly impossible task um which is so I, I kind of feel like 
in an ideal world, um, you would remember that you enjoyed the author, but perhaps not why. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I mean, if you think about films, people are so unaware of screenwriters so that they, you, 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 when you approach, um, so you might have seen several films by the same screenwriter, but you won't know that you've seen, and you'll come with very little expectation. You might think, you might come with the expectation of the actor, think, oh, I like films with that person in. You might even come with an expectation of the director thinking, I like their, what they do. But you don't really know, have expectations of where the story is going or what type of story it is. And I suppose it would be nice for, for authors to kind of have that sort of freedom to, because we want to surprise you. That's, that's you know, our, our thing. But, you know, if you're going to, if whenever you keep coming with, you know, I want the same again, but more, um, there's, there's only one way that that can end, really, ultimately. So are you sending anonymous letters to your publisher saying, Mike Gale should write a horror book or something because you'd like to try something different? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not that I wanted to write something different. Um, you know, I, I when I come to write a story, I am not thinking about the previous book or the one before that. But I know that readers are. Um, and it, it'd just be nice to kind of be taken I suppose it's, it's a little bit like having children when children go to school and you know they've got an elder sibling and you know teachers can quite often go oh right okay you're another you're, uh, I know you're mm. your sibling so you're exactly like that and you kind of go well no actually I'm, I'm my own person I'm completely different and I suppose that's what you want for your books you want them to be taken on their yeah, own merits individually and not and not compared yeah i can i can yes, understand yeah. that if you could go yeah. back to when you were writing your very first book and whisper something in your ear what do you think do you know what i th- i would just say well done um because the the shocking thing about um when i remember writing my first book my legendary girlfriend was I didn't know anything. I'd never written a novel before. When I read My Legendary Girlfriend now, I'm just, I'm, I'm really shocked by how well written it is, how um, I seem to have a sense of, a, an understanding of plot and character that um, just seem to be there. So I, I'm actually, I'm actually shocked by how, I, you know, you, you kind of, when you do things, when you've been, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And I'm, when you've been doing something, you know, you know, you're doing it all day, every day, across 20 years, you learn a lot of things. And I'm just, so you, you would inevitably think that when you look at something you write in the early days, you'd, you'd almost want to cringe. But actually, when I read Manager Girlfriend, I don't feel like that. It, it feels like something um, really well written and accomplished. So um, I'd say well done. Yeah, well done. I think that's so lovely to look back and be proud of all all your hard work and from the very beginning. I think that's... I'm, ju- I'm just shocked that I, 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 I... There are things that I understood... Um, um, on some sort of level, mainly I guess from 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 reading, from mm. reading a just reading a lot of books and just sort of not really knowing what I was doing, but sort of soaking it. But up. having soaking it up, that's it, yeah, mm. and expressing it without really knowing what it was I was expressing. Well, that's wonderful, and your book is wonderful. Thank you. So, Mike Gale, author of the Museum of Ordinary People, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you. And so coming up now, we've got five questions in five minutes about the book Such a Good Mother and three more book reviews. Right, let's get on to this book. My goodness, it's enough to put you off school forever. And I've just dropped the note. There we go. See, I do make notes, sign of old age, make notes when reading a book. Uh, Here we go. Such a Good Mother by Helen Monks. Takar. Let me read you the blurb. Listen to, listen to this one. Rose O'Connell aspires to be the perfect mother. 
With a loving husband and a bright future ahead for her son, Charlie, she's tantalisingly close to the life she's always dreamed of, one that's a far cry from her own troubled upbringing. Now Rose has an unexpected chance to make some influential new friends at Charlie's prestigious school. The circle, an elite group of mothers with beauty, wealth and connections, rule the place and every other mum would kill for an invitation. Once Rose joins, her social status starts to soar. But what is each woman hiding beneath her perfect exterior? Why did one of their previous members take their own life? And why have they singled out unassuming Rose to take her place. Let's do the first sentence of this. Mm. Her body has barely begun to cool. She awaits discovery on the playground's tarmac, hidden behind the wide metal gate that leads into the Wolf Academy, where Ginny Kirkbride is currently punching the wrong sequence of digits into the entrance's keypad. Uh, I really enjoyed this. And it in the end of the book, in the sort of acknowledgements, Helen talks about how she deleted 150,000 words when writing this book. Can you imagine? Um, it's a book that draws you in. I was definitely shouting at Rose and her decisions and the impact on her child. And yet you're still drawn in. And it did make me think about fitting in at the school gate and parents and uh, yeah, all, all sorts of things. So let's go to Helen now. Helen Monks, Taka, author, your latest wonderful book, Such a Good Mother. Welcome to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's an absolute joy to, to be here. And so I'm going to have to put you on the spot with your five questions in five minutes if you um, are ready. OK. Great. Your first question. Can you describe your book in less than a minute? Uh, Such a Good Mother is about a down at heel working mum who can't seem to do anything right career stalling, marriage, bit iffy, um, but she's got this delightful four-year-old boy that she decides to send to the Wolf Academy, which is run essentially by a group of very beautiful, stylish, charismatic women called The Circle. When one of their members dies from apparent suicide in the playground, there's an opening and it sends shockwaves through the community when Rose gets in. And initially, it's very much a sort of fish out of water story as this quite humble woman tries to navigate these insta-perfect lives. But as the darkness of both the story and the circle and the Wolf Academy are revealed, it's a lesser case of um, fish out of water than the fox is in the chicken coop. And you've previously written about a sort of a toxic work environment and now a toxic school yeah. environment. What, are you getting these these gems from real life or uh, is that nothing to do with what you've um, experienced? So I suppose it would be, uh, I have to be careful here. So, so the yeah. book isn't set anywhere. It's kind of an, ev an every town. So the, t the town in which the wolf lives and the area in which the wolf exists has rapidly gentrified. So the issue for Rose is, is that she's a native and she knew the place when it was menacing and it was rough. And her dad, who was a con artist, sort of ruled the streets. Now the streets are ruled by sort of artisan bakeries and, you know. <laughs> so there are some similarities to where I live, which is in Stoke Newington. I have to say that the school that my kids go to is nothing like the Wolf Academy. But there are elements, I guess, of that, you know, competitive mothering that you see and competitive parenting you see, not just in Stoke Newington, but, you know, everywhere. Uh, everywhere there yeah. are there are working mums in particular, there is competitiveness. I don't think that's unfair to, to say. And brilliant women getting stuff done. But obviously I don't write about that. I write about the really gnarly, nasty <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and there's plenty of that in Such a Good Mother. <laughs> Oh, there is. I'm interested in your answer to the next question. Which is your favourite character in your book that was one of the smaller characters, not the main ones? So Rose's sister-in-law, um, Jack, is the moral heart of this book, if there is one. Mm. You know, she's a woman, a really intelligent, working class woman who's now doing her anthropology degree at night school. And I just like the idea of having this good person who lived without shame but really super intelligent capable good-hearted human being interpreting this very sort of uh there's these big dramas in quite intellectual ways that are also really sort of humane um but sort of yeah um 
unusual interpretations. So I love what Jack brings. It was just nice to write a a, a, a likable character. I don't really do likable characters. It's one of the yeah, I'm trying. I sometimes I try, and she's definitely my attempt to be likable. <laughs> no, that's great. The next question is: Can you describe your book in three words? Okay, so the the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use the descriptor my husband gave me of this book, which is Scarface for mums. <laughs> I like it. I just think it's kind of genius. I can do no better than that. Um, what was the food and drink that you consumed the most when you were writing this particular book? And did it was it different to your previous book? Well, uh, I make no secret in my uh, acknowledgements that I had to re- re- rewrite this baby twice. So it's not been the easiest gestation. Anyway, the, the mm. major rewrite I did in lockdown, lockdown one when you know no one knew anything so first thing we did in lockdown was like really like do rations essentially because we did like really afraid of do you remember like we're afraid of food running out Mm. and then um Mm. so my husband is um i guess british punjabi you might describe him so we got a massive like 10 kilo bag of attar like chapati flour and a load of lentils and we just lived on rice and lentils uh, and obviously cracked open the beer every time the press conference came on because what else could you do? Um, so that was the um, that was the uh, the foods the foods of the major rewrite. Yeah, I went through this phase where I would buy tins even if they sounded yeah. like the most disgusting Ooh. food possible. Um, I just of mackerel no. soup. I'll have that. It's yes, there. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Meatballs in brine. Uh, I mean, definitely. That's... I'm waiting for a harvest festival where <laughs> I can sort of give those yeah. things. <laughs> Regifting to the world. Yeah. Your in brine. Yes. Um, your last question. What's been the best moment so far in your book writing career? Do you know what? It's been, I've just got to meet so many cool women. Just brilliant, supportive, clever women that just, you know, a lot of like the, um, so I haven't, because of lockdown and what have you, haven't always been able to, to meet them in person. But the whole, you know, people like you, the Bookstagram community, the, you know, the the book Twitter people, the, the brilliant authors who've been so kind and, and have, you know, been lucky enough to make some of them my friends, all the publicists, all my agent people, they're all most, mostly women. Um, there are, you know, there are a couple of male champions too. But um, yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to have... Um, my world expanded and to be helped and endorsed and learned from really clever, lovely women. Oh, what a wonderful, uplifting answer to that question. That's... Well, I'm not all, I'm not as dark as my books, you see. This is the thing. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually a very happy person who believes in the goodness of human nature, <laughs> despite appearances. Yeah, but still, people need to read your book. Well, Helen Monks Tucker, author of Such a Good Mother, thank you so very much for joining me today. Oh, no, thank you very much for having me. It's been brilliant. Do you know, talking about performing parents and such like did make me remember that when my first child was at nursery and she moved nurseries before she was two, I think, and it was quite early on, so I think she must have been about 12 months old, um, we were asked that she... Uh, do a sort of a montage of pictures of Europe and it was I know it was supposed to be just a bit of fun with glue this was a nursery that gave you homework but for me it was the first piece of homework we'd had at the house for my child and I wanted to make an impression and I remember spending all Sunday Uh, getting pictures of different places in Europe and arranging them on this thing. My daughter didn't get a look in. I was just like, no, I'm doing this. Leave this to me. And producing, it was brilliant, I have to say, very impressive. And I remember taking it to the nursery on the Monday, so proud of it. And it got put on the board, you know, like the best contributions board. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. The Clearly, they knew that my daughter had not got a look in with this, and it was me. But I just felt, you know, consumed to do it. Um, once you're on your second child, you're just like, can we just get them to nursery? And you don't, 
you don't think about homework or anything. Although with his nursery, we didn't get homework. So maybe that was it. But uh, yes, I, I just had a flashback of that. Fun times. Anyway, the next three books are ones that I read on holiday. And the first one is you ha all have to go out and you have to buy this immediately. The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward. And Catriona is going to come on in a few weeks some months sometime soon to talk about her latest book Sundial so that's exciting um but this I've heard lots of people talking about it but I thought it was too much down the horror route and I wouldn't be able to cope um but oh such a book uh let me read you the blurb this is the story of a murderer a stolen child revenge. This is the story of Ted, who lives with his young daughter Lauren and his cat Olivia in an ordinary house at the end of an ordinary street. All these things are true, and yet some of them are lies. An unspeakable secret binds the family together, and when a new neighbour moves in next door, the truth may destroy them all, because there's something buried in the dark forest at the end of Needless Street, but it's not what you think. This is the sort of book that having read it, you sit there just like, oh, my goodness. And you wish you could delete from your memory and go back and start again. It's yes, there are some uncomfortable things in it, but it is a book to read. It's it's just blows your mind. It's incredible. Shall I just do the first sentence? Um, Ted Bannerman. Today is the anniversary of a little girl with Popsicle. It happened by the lake 11 years ago. She was there and then she wasn't. So it's already a bad day when I discover that there is a murderer among us. Uh, I, I don't want to say any more. I don't need to say any more. It's a powerful, punchy, sensational read. It's one that I will be telling everyone to, to get. If you haven't read it, get it, read it. Very good. There we go. The next one, The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller. OK, let's do the blurb first, but I've got a lot to say on this. Here we go. On a perfect August morning, Elle Bishop heads out for a swim in the pond below the Paper Palace, her family's holiday home in Cape Cod. As she dies beneath the water, she relives the passionate encounter she had the night before against the side of the house that knows all her darkest secrets, while her husband and mother chatted to their guests inside. So begins a story that unfolds over 24 hours and 50 years as Elle's shocking betrayal leads her to a decision that will change her life forever. Right, let's do the first sentence of this book. Things come from nowhere. The mind is empty and then, inside the frame, a pair. Perfect, green, the stem atilt a single leaf. It sits in a white ironstone bowl nestled amongst the limes in the centre of a weathered picnic table on an old screen porch at the edge of a pond deep in the woods beside the sea. OK, so this is a book that I've heard a lot about. It was a Richard and Judy choice. I got it to take on holiday and I didn't actually get to read it on holiday, but I thought I would get round to it. I had seen that some people were raving about this book and some people were uncertain and uncertain is an understatement. And in our Quick Book Reviews Facebook group, the response was not good about it, that people were put, put off, that they didn't enjoy it, that they stopped reading it partway through, that it was made of some very uncomfortable subjects. So it did put me off, but I thought, well, it was on my pile to read on holiday or when I got back, I'm going to read it. And I think that helped. I also think the issue is the cover and the blur, because the cover, there's this house in the background, a lake, a boat. You've got the Sunday Times quoting it, saying it's earthy, intoxicating, shimmering. Marianne Keyes says, glorious and gorgeous. Reese Witherspoon says, I was totally immersed. It makes it appear that it is heartwarming. Yes, a story and maybe some sad things along the way, but it's just a, an experience, an expedition of somebody's story. Oh, let me tell you, there's this book has all sorts of abuse in it. It's sadistic. It's cold. It's bitter. It's sad. But taking all that into account and if the 
blurbs had been different, if the cover had been different, you know, if it had been a somebody curled up under a table on the cover, then I think people would enjoy it more because the right sort of person would have picked it up. I think it sort of lulls you in with, oh, I'm I'm a gentle read, come read me. And then it sort of punches you with a fist covered in glass and uh, and, you're, and you're left reeling. Uh, having said all of that, and probably because I went in assuming I was going to hate it, I did. You can't say you enjoyed this book because it's just so... Some of the things that the character's been through, oh my goodness! It's but it's it's good. I what else do I say apart from I enjoyed it because it was so it's, it's awful reading these awful things. But it was a good read. It really was. They just need to change the cover and, and the quotes. Um, you know, if if the blurb was that this is the hardest thing I've had to read, but the best, then that that might be better. You know, if someone said, "Oh, it's brutally." brilliant, shocking, sensational, then you wouldn't get all the negative book reviews, I think. But that's just my opinion. So uh, what am I saying to you about this book? I'm saying if you can cope with some pretty horrifying stories in it, um, go in with the right concept about what the book is about, then I think you would think it was a very good book. So there we go. That's that's my take on it. And the final one, How to Kidnap the Rich by Rahul Rana. Now, I did actually read this on holiday and my expectations were high for this. I thought it was going to be a bit like How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey. I, I thought it was going to be that sort of thing. Let's read the blurb. Ramesh Kumar grew up deprived and unloved, working on his father's tea stall in the old city of Delhi. Now brilliant but poor, he makes a lucrative living, taking tests for the sons of India's elite. When one of his clients, the sweet but hapless 18-year-old Rudy Saxena, places first in the All Indias, the National University Entrance Exams, Ramesh sees an unmissable opportunity. Cashing in on Rudy's newfound celebrity all goes well for both boys for a while, but Rudy's role on a game show leads the boys through a maze of crimes, both large and small, and their dizzying journey reveals an India in all its complexity, beauty and squalor. Right, and let's do the first sentence. The first kidnapping wasn't my fault. The others, those were definitely me. As I say, I really wanted to enjoy this book, but I didn't get on with the the narrator and the style of writing. The sentences are very short and punchy. The writing short and punchy. Nothing wrong with that. I thought it was an interesting premise. I just wasn't gripped from the start, but I think that's because before I'd read a couple of very gripping, immersive books. And I think, you know, it's so unfortunate for this author. There's nothing wrong with the book. It's just how I felt about it. But coming off the book of the back of those few books, um, I probably wasn't in the best place for another gripping book. So read it, see what you think. Ignore me. What do I know? It just, uh, but I've got to be honest, but it just didn't do it for me, um, which I'm a bit sad about. But I think I'm going to keep hold of it and try it again because you never know. I may enjoy it another time. So there we go. Those are the books. What did we cover? We covered The Museum of Ordinary People by Mike Gale, Such a Good Mother by Helen Monks Takar, The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward, The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller, and How to Kidnap the Rich by Rahul Rana. Now, next week, we've got some brilliant books to talk to you about. I absolutely can't wait. However, I need to tell you what the lovely Facebook group have been reading because they've been reading a lot of different books. So let me tell you all these books before I go. So Katie uh, is reading The No Show by Beth O'Leary. I've not read that one. Jude is reading a book about Elvis, Graceland by Bethan Roberts, because she's going to go and watch the new Elvis film. And I love that film, I do have to say. Leslie's reading Magpie by Elizabeth Day. I need to read that for one of my book clubs coming up. Laura's reading How to Kill Your Family by Bella Mackey and her children 
children are a little alarmed at the title. And Helen's got the same problem because she's reading All Families of Psychotic by Douglas Copeland. <laughs> uh, Claire's reading The Waitress by Nina Manning. Uh, she's got to read that quickly because she's got to write a review on that soon. Um, Johan's reading A Slow Fire Burning by Paula Hawkins. Um, and she says she's preferring it to go on a train. Yeah, I really enjoyed A Slow Fire Burning, actually, Johan. Nancy's reading Dark Waters by Lynn McEwen, and she's enjoying it. Deirdre's reading Devotion by Hannah Kent. Deb is re reading The Curator by W.M. Craven. Woohoo! Anne's reading The Cliff House by Chris Bookmark. I've read quite a few of Chris's books, but I haven't read The Cliff House. Please let me know what you think, Anne. Nick's reading I Know What I Saw by Imran Mahmood. And of course, we've had Imran on recently. And uh, Jean's reading The It Girl by Ruth Ware. We've got Ruth Ware coming on soon. And Cindy is reading The Project by Courtney Summers. She's on page 127. And so far, she's liking it. So that's it. You'd be very welcome to join us there on Facebook. Just look for the quick quick book reviews podcast group and you will find us there well i'm off to wear another t-shirt that misleads more people um maybe i need to get one that says hope hope in books that would be my motto anyway i've taken up enough of your time just look after yourselves and i'll see you very soon take care now bye bye you've been listening to the quick book reviews podcast that's enough books said no one ever see you again soon